Good morning and welcome to Steve Wraith's True Crime Podcast and I'm delighted to welcome an old friend of the show who has uh, just uh, come home uh, and it's Mr Kevin Lane. How are you Kevin? Good morning. I'm fine, good thank you. See, good to see you mate, good to see you. And Kevin has got a book out which we'll be talking a lot about. It's called Fitted Up and Fighting Back by Kevin Lane. Uh, we're going to talk about Kevin's life today and he is going to tell us what that book's about. Fascinating read. Um, he is known as the UK's Mr. Shawshank, and, and for, for that reason, you will find out in due course. But, um, Kevin, let's just go back to your start. Let's paint a picture a little bit about you. Where, where were you born, first of all, Kevin? I was born in Harefield, Middlesex, a lovely little village. Um, plenty of pubs, plenty of activity in the summer. Nice to go to school there and to grow up as a child in the countryside. Nice to be able to walk to school through the fields along the canal sometimes, it was lovely. So I grew up and went to school there. Um, uh, John Penrose, which is now an academy, got expelled. Had quite a good childhood. It's great growing up in the countryside, swings and lakes and boats and Amazons and Indians. Plenty of fun. Um, they say spend a bit of time in the countryside or in the garden each day. It's good for your health. Well, I had all my childhood in the countryside, so it was fun. Tell us a little bit about your parents, Kevin. Father's Scottish, mother's English. So I'm a Cockney jock. Um, my father's from uh, <clears throat> Fife. He's passed away now. Uh, my mother's from Brentford. Um, I think I take after my father. I very much look like my father. Um, I have his ways. I do believe in nature and nurture. It's amazing how you can have your father's ways. From an early age, as my children have my ways, and obviously I spent 20 years in prison, but they've still got my mannerisms and, and such. So, yeah. You said it was a happy. You said it was a happy childhood. I mean, you know, any any memories that stick out from from then? You know, holidays and that kind of thing. Butlins, I think we've all got a Butlins holiday, haven't we, Ellis? Yeah, definitely. Motorbikes and building campfires and building uh, houses out of straw bales and then getting chased off by the far the farmer. Swings, massive swings in dells, going off right out. Loved it and uh, air raid shelters and pretending you're a soldier and such. A lot of motorbikes in the days and bits and pieces, pellet guns as a child, PB shooters. That, yeah. Um, it was great. Yes. I had a paper round as a child there. Yes. Happy that memories then, uh, Kevin. That's at 12. I worked happy. in the yeah, happy memories. Lots of work in the countryside. I was in the bakers when I was just after 12, paper round at 12, 13 into the bakers at 5 o'clock in the morning. So I've worked from an early age. I like work. I went from the bakers into a chip shop, a uh, chip shop to a local builder when I was 14. I started work with a building uh, at 14. I got expelled from school. I went straight into work. I went to school one day a week, four days work release. Uh, I moved into a flat when I was 15 with a friend of mine who was 18. So I had my own flat at 15. Um, and I just love work. And so much so I purchased my first flat. I bought my first flat when I was 18 for £67,000 in Hillingdon. Got my first mortgage. I was a good earner. I mean, you, you get out of what you put into, into life. Um, so Harefield taught me that. If you want a few pennies, go to work. And get your money, whether it's a, uh, a gardening round at a very early age when I was in the juniors, and it went on from there to any work I could get. Really, it's nice to have a pound note in your pocket, and be able to provide for yourself at an early age. I bought all my own school uniforms when I was 12. I went to school with a different pair of trousers, a shirt, and cardigan, or jumper on each day, a pair of shoes, different watch at 12, and I'm proud of that. And more kids should work nowadays, whether it's for fun, gardening, cleaning the car. It gives you good structure in life to go forward. Um, 
as well as a lot of sadness, my brother got run over when we was little. He had to wear a Mr. Magoo crash helmet, an extended crash helmet on his head at school in the in the uh, infants. That caused uh, some problems in an uh, early age for us. Maybe that's where I, uh, I started uh, having a few run-ins with some older lads. Look, kids do. You all go up in school. Children can be very cruel. They don't mean to be cruel normally. It's just in their nature to be take the mickey out of people. We've all done it. Um, and then as you get older, you bump into friends at school who you never spoke to, and then they're, they're lovely people. So it shows what we're like as children to when we grow to adults, how the tables turn. But, yeah, I've had a good life, apart from spending 20 years in prison. That situation with your brother was obviously something which, um, you know, forced you into defending, you know, defending him, defending his honour. And, you know, you, you decided to take up boxing. I think you were around nine or ten. You, you ended up going to Bushy ABC. Tell us a little bit about that. Were, were, you, were you a natural boxer? Did you have to work at it? I was a better, uh, yeah, I was a natural fighter. I was very good at my, as a young boy with my hands, very fast hands. Uh, John Scott, which is the, our trainer, he said I had the fastest hands in the gym. I did so fast hands, admittedly, um, very fast. Get a bit slower as you get older, though. Um, so I was a good gym fighter. I would go to the gym, take my energy levels out. I loved it. I loved getting in the ring and sparring. Uh, not, not so much... I would have become professional if I hadn't gone to prison. Uh, I used to spar with a lot of professionals, Zuma Nelson, a lot of uh, professionals, Bob Williams, Carlos Chase, and other professionals I could name um, when I was an amateur. So I must have been doing something, right? Got a few good ideas. Yeah. You all I mean, do you ever look back on that, Kevin, and wish that you'd stuck to that? Because boxing, you know, sometimes is, uh, you know, quite lucrative for people. You know, you have to work hard at it, like you have to work hard at everything in life. But did you ever wonder, you know, do you ever look back and think, I could have been a contender? Yes, definitely. I remember I've not, I got in a ring with sparring with uh, lads who box for England. And I remember one occasion I got in the ring, about 14, uh, got in the ring and I was, I smashed the, the, uh, the England camp boy up in the first round. I just got in the ring and the dad got in after to spar me. And he smashed me straight in the nose, the dad did. I never forgot it. But I continued. Um, I was pretty good with my hands when I was natural. And I find you should stick to what you're good at, not try to adapt your natural style. Work with what you've got. Unfortunately, if I'd have stuck to what I was naturally good at, my own, uh, what felt natural to me, uh, things would have been a lot better. But I do believe uh, if I hadn't gone to prison and uh, injuries and stuff like that, I could have uh, could have had a go, like most people. But the money's not in it. like, And you've got to do, you say the money's in it. That's okay when you get to British and European championship levels. But you have a long road. You have to earn money. I mean, when I bought my first house at 18, I had uh, my first son, so I had to provide for them, so I could earn more money working. Uh, I, I remember when I was working, I was taking um, a significant wage at 18, decent wage, like £750 a week when I was 18. You know, some years ago, you know, 32 years ago, not bad, 34 years ago, in fact. And I was making more than that some weeks. So a lot of people would be happy to make that now. And I mean, I would call my wages going up to like, I stopped when I was 21, some weeks I'd earn over £4,000 selling in sales. So boxing couldn't provide that for me in the short space of time that, or the long space of time that I'd have had to go down. Although it's something like professional boxers in this country now, I think there's 1,400 opposed to say 50 years ago, there was 40,000 or 40 years ago. I'm not sure what the figures are, but, you know, it just shows uh, the difference in to become an area champion, southern area champion or whichever champion you wish. 
that was a worthy title. I'm not saying it isn't now, but you had to have a lot more fights then to get anywhere and to get any money at it. Now, you can be subbing near a title of having four fights. Yeah, so quite it's, it's true. I mean, I'm involved in the pro boxing game. I'm a, you know, I've been a promoter for, for what, nine years now, a manager for nine years, and it, it, it's it's getting harder. But unfortunately, now it's a ticket game as well. Fighters to, to make a living have to, uh, have to sell tickets. And if you don't sell tickets, you don't get on the shows. It's as simple as that. And uh, it's, become about, it's become about money. It's hard. It's, it's probably easier now for a fighter wanting to make money just to go on the road and be a journeyman. But even there, becoming really hard to find now, Kevin, you know? Journeyman, you, you're in the ring getting bashed up. You know, you're That's slugging right. it out of a lot of people. Um, you come out with a nose across you, big ear holes. I've got ear holes anyway. I don't need to be getting bashed up to be a journeyman. You know what they say, Steve, make and miss, make and pay. Luckily, I've, fit, I've weathered well. I mean, I haven't got a smashed up face. Been it a few times. But I definitely wouldn't have gone into the pro game uh, more so because of the money. You know, I'm talking about you'd get £300 for an exhibition fight when I was boxing, £500 for a six-rounder before you get a name. And then you've got your, you know, your fees to pay out of that, your training or your coach. There's not enough to live on, is there? No, of course it's not, mate. Of course it's not. No, it's not the uh, it's not the streets paved with gold that it's made out to be, uh, unless you're Anthony Joshua or Tyson Fury. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're like, yeah. you, got, you got expelled. What, what did you get expelled for? Um, I was caught in the sixth form hut, um, and the, the teacher, Mr. Maynard, I'll never forget him, I was in there with Richard Maylin, a very promising footballer, who was trying him with three professional clubs and jacked it all in. But he would have been the next uh, gas going by. He used to score from corners. He was that good, literally. And that's something, isn't it? Left and right foot, he could do that, by the way. And a phenomenal player. And uh, we was caught in the sixth form hut with him, and the teacher bit me, started throwing me out and started having a wrestling. He bit my arm. And I obviously, uh, I punched him. I got expelled for it. Yeah, I think they'd had enough of caning me. I used to like having fun. I mean, I just liked having fun. I, I, I'm not a dope. I can read and I wrote my own book, as you know. Um, I can read well, should I say. Um, uh, I just I had too much energy, so the boxing was good for me. Uh, the cane, I remember with Richard Maiden, we broke a window playing football, and Mr. Davis came out, the deputy head. Now, Richard had never had the cane, and I'd had it that many times. I like, yeah, hurts, of course. Hurts to wash your hands more. And he's saying to us, you know, we didn't mean to break the window, we were just playing football. And he says, so what do you think the punishment is? I said, I think we should have the cane. <laughs> My mates looked at me, and said, hey, what? And he's looking at me saying, are you sure? I said, I think we should have the cane, Mr. Davis, right? So there we are, two strokes across the hands. Oh, it's painful, I've got to say. But I found that highly amusing. My mate was looking at me and saying, you cannot be real. You've just given us the cane, Kevin. I got. I went first, and uh, I was laughing when I got outside. All oh, my hands were sticking. I was thinking, oh, please, man, so, so, and so, and so, yeah. It, I try to find the best in things and turn things into a positive, even though when it's, you know, oh, I'm going to get the cane. So, yeah. yeah. So, obviously, you know, you're out of school. Um, you know, as you get older, you're looking to make money. What's, what's the first, you know, what's the first step on the ladder for, for, for work for you, Kevin? I did, I did an apprentice uh, carpenter and I went into uh, fashionist joinery for a year. Then I went on to site, uh, first and second fixing, and then shop fitting and kitchen fitting in the fourth uh, year. So and I went to college um, in Southall. Um, I enjoyed that. Uh, so that's when I was earning good money because I was working away up and down the country in first leisure discos and such, refurbing them in shops and bits and pieces. So you got a lot of money working away money and. 15 pounds a night for a meal and such. Um, and then I went from there to market stalls, selling gold and clothes. But I spent more than I earned because I was working away Little Halen, uh, Halen Island, Little Hampton, Bogner Regis. And just seemed to be out more, you know. So we went out every evening with my friend. He had a gold store. 
store and I had uh, the clothes. He had clothes as well, actually. Um, that didn't prosper for too long, like the summer. It was just more enjoying myself. And then I went into cars. I did very well at cars. Bought my first flat, like I say. Sold that within six months. Took a, a nice profit out of that. And then I went into sales. Irish life, mortgage broker. Did very well at that. I was fourth in the south of England in business within two weeks. And I was taking home, you know, uh, I think the smallest check I took home there was £900 one week. It was all in there like 1500 2000 4000 So that was a good good living for me, considering the headmaster said to me, the deputy, he said, you will not amount to anything, he said, when you leave. I thought, oh, really? I bet you're not earning £4,000 a week. That's a little bit, I shouldn't be so bitchy there, but I'm proud to say I've gone forward in life and educated myself and uh, made the best of my life. Um, and I went from there then to selling cars. I had my first Porsche when I was 18, a 911 Turbo. Wow. Bought, bought that from Henley's in Barclays Square. That was £27,000, uh, 18. So that would be £100,000 plus now. And I paid for that. I had a few cars actually at the time. Then I bought my first house when I was uh, 21. Nice house. Uh, and I went into selling Hoovers. And Hoovers was phenomenal for me. I mean, um, I was earning £15,000 a month uh, selling Kirby cleaners. And I became an area distributor within six months in my own office. That was phenomenal. Selling Hoovers, who would have thought it? But I loved it because I believed in the product. And if you believe in a product and people like you, they will buy from you. And the product was exceptional. So, I, like I say, work always sat well with me. And I like meeting people. So I was going into homes. Sometimes I sold two cleaners in one home when they had visitors. That's something. So, I so gifted a gab, Kevin, I suppose, you know, because that's what you need to be, you know, somebody in sales. You gotta be genuine. People, in, they will buy from you if they like you, and if they, you know, they can see it, you're passionate. If you believe in something, um, you don't even have to sell it because you're passionate about it, and people pick up on that. I found in life, um, it works well for you when you can look people in the eyes and be honest and friendly and warm, and there's there's no you can be transparent. That's what you have to be. Uh, I enjoyed I enjoy work, and then um, I went to prison after a security firm. I purchased that to go into what you've got now. Um, I purchased a security company to do camera security, and I had a, an appointment in Ells Court with an American supplier. With a friend of mine who's now passed away, he was older than me, so I'd have done the sales. He'd have done the the, the office work. Well, he'd have run the offices. And uh, I went sent, got sent to prison for a kidnapping. But otherwise, if you look at that now when I was 18, you think about where camera security is now. And there was no one doing it. So I bought the security company solely for that as a stepping stone. It was too much ag, you know, managing getting people to go to clubs many years ago when it wasn't so, so busy as it is now in the security game. And um, it was a different game then as well, rougher in some aspects, mind you. I think the streets have got rougher all over now, but back in the day, it was a man's game where you have to be a, 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 a lot of the time a tough cookie to go into the door. And it would only be places that needed dormant that would have security. Now, most places have got security, whether they need them or not. So normally, the places that I had security at, they were called for. So you was earning your money a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going back to my era. I mean, I did the doors in, you know, 18 years in Newcastle. Uh, I did um, also did Ibiza, did London as well. So I'd, I've worked, you know, in, in, a, in a vast amount of places, bars and nightclubs. But security was lucrative in those days, Kevin. So, you know, for somebody who was 
you know, such an intelligent businessman and, you know, making money to the point where you're driving a, a fl you know, flash cars and having money in the bank and having your own house at 21, it's no surprise that you, you're going to move to an industry which essentially is, 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 is going to increase your profits. So, you know, di you went into it obviously with an open mind, but did you realise that this was, you know, this was going to lead ultimately to, you know, to, you know, some major incidents in your life? Um, no, I didn't. Um, I went into it as a business, uh, thinking of the bigger picture. Because uh, I would have expanded, look like hotels and hospitals. Look at the security there. I had that vision 34 years ago. And it was in my, if I did an introductory letter to you, it would be on there. Now look. So, yeah, it was, it was business. And then it did take me to, I got shot on the door. I've had guns pulled on me. Um, some of them not the best decision making process, I must add. And I've had guns pulled on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I got shot once, a gentleman shot me. I asked him what he was going to do with it, and he said he was going to sh shoot you. Yeah, tell us about that because that, that's in the book. And I mean, obviously, the book, I will keep plugging it uh, unashamedly. Uh, Fitted Up and Fighting Back by Kevin Lane, available on Amazon. Yeah. The links, the links down below. But tell us about that situation because that was that was in, that was a that was at the door of a premises, wasn't it? Yeah, what I did, I brought in, so I would contact um, establishments, breweries and such, not just all privately owned pubs, pubs, but I would say that I can guarantee to get security to you within half an hour of your premises because I've got operatives that live in the vicinity. But for that fee, for you to be able to have that, it would cost you £50 a week to be able to pick the phone up and I'd get security to you if you had a problem. So that it gave you a little bit of security knowing you could pick the phone up uh, and get that service. In the same breath, you didn't have to pay for security every night. And it worked very well. So one of the places I had, I received a call, and uh, a gentleman had been down to the pub. He'd had some problems there. He was uh, barred, and he came back. Um, but I had no problems with him. Never met the gentleman. I say gentleman. I, I don't uh, mean him any malice or such, the industry I was in. And uh, so we went down to the, the, the premises. I had my two best mates to be Marcus the Mayor and Dave Wolf. And um, Dave was a very big black Jamaican man at the time. He like, spoke like a transvestite, oh my goodness. But he was a big lump and very polite. And Marcus looked like he's got Tourette's when he gets agitated, <laughs> twitches about a bit. So and then there was me standing in the middle, a little college boy. So we was outside the premises and this mini pulled up and he was only about 10 feet away from me. And, the, and the, I was talking to a, a lad who was at the premises and he asked the lad if he was all right and the, the kid said he was. And he said, you all right, mate? I said, yeah, I'm all right. Uh, he said, do you want some of this? I said, what are you going to do with that then? He said, I'm going to kill you. I went, go on then. Of course, Marcus and Dave, they were break dancing. One went that way, one went that way. The kid I was talking to, he went that way. And I stood there, and he's left the, the gun on the window of the car he was sitting in. And as he's picked it up, I could see he was going to shoot it, and he's gone bang, and I've gone, I ducked, and he got me in the head, and I, thought, I felt stunned at first. And I had flashing lights in my head, and there was all blood running down my face, and I looked at him, I thought, you fucking bastard. And now that I've gone to him again, he's pointing at me again. So I thought, I better become like Usain Bolt, and I went, I took off right around the corner, um, persuaded his friend to come with me, shall we say, and I went looking for him. I went home, first of all, and stuck a load of cotton buds in my head because I had big holes and the lead has gone into my skull. I still have seven pieces of lead in my skull now. So it goes into, you've got half an inch of skin on your head, haven't you? So I had all blood pouring out and I was, the big holes, I was filled with cotton buds, cut them off, went back looking for this lad. Um, the police swooped on my car, stripped it, nothing in it, of course. Uh, I thought, I'll get this bleeding lad. So I went home, uh, and then my house got lit up like a floodlight, like a football pitch by floodlights. And it was the armed police, and they come and took me away, arrested me. I can't make this out. I said, I'm, What are you arresting me for? He said, You've been, I've been shot. They said, Yeah, but there's been a gun involved, so they arrested me. Um, that was quite eventful. And then, even when I wasn't working, 
So you'd go to venues like the Paradise Club, well-known club in London. It would be open from Friday till Saturday at 2 o'clock and Saturday evening till Sunday at the same time. Went all through the night. It's a queue to get in there. Very rough gaff at the time. Shootings on the door and things like that. So looking like I did, I had some friends who worked in there, also worked for me. Uh, they did a shit, they had their own interest there as well. And it was a very busy club. I went there with a friend. I had a rave myself, I did a few raves, and it was I used to advertise on Kiss FM. So I finished the rave with Roy the Roach, Judge Jules, Danny Ramplin, all major DJs in their time played at my events. So I, I did four in the end. So I finished my rave, I had a big commercial yard because I was, I was actually doing the metal, roll on and roll off skips. So I was going to source the rubbish and the metals in my day. So again, before my time, now look at it. You're looking back in 1991 when I had I set that up. Um, it's gone phenomenal now, isn't it, in the, the metal yeah. game and in the sourcing. So we went to this club after I had the rave. I had like a, a, it was called a Nissan hut, they're like aircraft hangers. But you get a juggernaut in there. Um, so we went to the Paradise Club. And I was sitting down having a cup of coffee with a friend of mine called Paul Cox. And this gentleman came over and he says to me, uh, can we have your drugs? He said, I haven't got any drugs on me. I'm just having a cup of coffee. Uh, and he started arguing with me. So I stood up and he had some security with him. And I didn't know. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, let's take this outside. I said, that respect for the doorman. I said, I don't want to argue with you. Let's take it outside. And he could have searched me if he wished, but he had no intention of searching me. I think it's because I had a nice watch on my arm. I could see I probably had a bit, a bit of money on. Uh, and I looked an easy touch for him, I suppose. Anyway, he threw a punch at me. Needless to say, it, it, uh, it kicked off pretty bad. The doorman that I didn't know came steaming in and was in the middle of Paul always said he was in the middle of them, just trading, punching. He was getting punched and coshed. I pulled out some gas. And I bleeding. It got split up, and they were standing a little way from me. My, then my pal came up, Sid McFarland, who worked there, asked what was going on. And I said, that these have tried to take a liberty of me, I said, and I'm not having it. I said, so you better go. I'm going to even it up. And I ran into him with the gas. Gas myself, of course, like a bleeding numpty. But I thought, we're all going to get gassed. I'll even the odds up. <laughs> Too many of you. I'll worry about getting gas later. <laughs> So like, I gassed them, gassed myself, uh, got dragged outside. I tried to get me down the stairwell. If I got me down the stairwell, they had to cave me in because they had like 20 odd stone dormant some of these. So I got outside and I had a few straighteners with them. I said, I'll have you. Come on. You bleeding. You jump me. So I picked one out, had a straightener, done him. And as I did him, they jumped me again. So I had that happen three times. And my third time I've been bashed and boshed and coshed and all sorts. And I was sprayed a bit more. And uh, I remember sitting on the, Sid come out, I'm sitting on the pavement now. I thought, I better get a bit of wind up me if I've got to have another go. And uh, I've done them all, I did them, fair play, I did them all. And I was like, only little fella. Like, so I remember Sid saying, that's enough now, Kevin. No more, he said. I said, all right, I said, but I'm telling you lot, I'll be back. I said, you watch, I'll be back for you lot. And when I left, the doorman said, they believed it. They said, he's definitely coming back, that fella. And I did go back there. I went back. I had a, I went up grounds with Daniela Westbrook in her heyday when she was, you know, she was at the height of her career, very pretty girl, very nice girl. And I was up there with her and she wanted me to go back to the party with her. But I had my mate with me, Kevin Jordan, and he stuttered. And I said, and I thought, no, I'm going to go to the paradise. I had it in my head. If I'm in London, we're going to the paradise. That's open. And I should have gone back with Daniela Westbrook, really. I mean, what an imitation as a young man's age, but real pretty girl, prime time TV all the time. I thought, no, I'm going down that bleeding paradise. So I told Kevin, we knew where there was a, a club we could go to. It's a great club. We'd be all right. Got in a cab, went there. Pulled up, and the door was going, it's him, it's him, it's him. Shut all the doors. All right? Well, that's not a very nice welcome. So a couple of doormen came out. I said, Kevin, what do you want? I just want to come in. My mate Kevin, Kevin Jordan, is starting. He's going, this is a fucking club, he said, the fucking fighter. <laughs> he was fired until he got a bit agitated. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is, yeah. It's fucking hell he's going, right? So I said, I want to come in. He said, I'm on my own. 
I said, you joined your own last time, Kevin. He said, he calls me and he said, you can't come in here. I said, come on, come in. There's going to be no trouble. He said, honestly, the dorm and they're not having you in here, Kevin. He said, but go to our other club. I'll phone down there. You can go down there. He said, and you'll be welcome down there. So I did. I went to another club and had a good night. I went home. So, yeah, that's some of my stories. I laugh about them, really, but I mean, you know, I was a little boy, college looking boy, like I say, from the countryside. I just enjoy life. It's, to, people are too sad for too long. And um, obviously, the situations that may cause us to ch change our temperaments at times, but overall, try to look on the positives in, in life rather than the negatives. And let's, as you can see, I talk about it, it's quite positive. Or human. Let's, fast for, let's fast forward to uh, 18th of December 1994. Uh, you were actually in my neck of the woods, you were up north. Uh, on a little sabbatical, weren't you? Uh, for a, and you, you had a night out, and uh, you came in contact with some rugby players. I did. I was getting around. I met all of your um, namesakes in Newcastle without naming them, and I had four yeah. different firms. I said, "No, listen, I'm just up here. I'll, I'll do, you know, my own thing. I'm just a bit of a. I'm not interested in saddling up with you or saddling up with you. I like you for you. I don't care if you don't get on with him. I'll get on with him. I'll get on with you." Just that's it, really. I won't get involved in your, you know, business affairs up here that you don't talk to. And I used to love it. So, but I used to find that I went to a, a rugby do in East Woodburn. And I'll never forget it. I'd, uh, there was a shop in Newcastle called Leaf at the time. Do you recall it? Many it's years still, ago. Brian is still there, Kevin. Leaf, is it Leaf Clothing? Leaf clothing. Brian is say. still there and he's still running at me. And when you come up here, uh, when you've got round all your uh, activities, etc., mate, it'll be great to get you in and see Brian. I'll bring a big wad of cash with me because he's very expensive, if I recall. Not when you get the family discount, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and after so, the time you've spent behind bars, mate, I'm sure I'll be able to get you some family discount. Don't worry about that, lad. Good, because I remember then you're looking like few years ago, I had a pair of shoes out of there. I think they were like 300 quid uh, then. And they give them to me. I bought, a, I spent a few quid in there. I think about just over a thousand pounds, maybe more than that. No, the jacket was 500 something pound. Um, and the shoes and that. And I spent a few quid in there. They give me a bit of discount actually because I spent a few quid. But uh, I've gone to this do in East Woodburn and I looked, I suppose I looked at, I look sharp. I know I look sharp. And the locals, they just didn't take to me because, like, young kid, you know, girls were warming to me, like, being very receptive, I must say. And they bump into me and one spilled a drink over me. And, you know, I was a bit fiery then. I said, like, come on, mind yourself, will you? But they didn't like it because the girls were chatting to me. So we've gone into the, the bar and I was with a friend of mine called Christopher Hampton. And he was... Uh, He's like Lord of the Manor, having you know, upper class, well educated, very good friend of mine. And there was a couple of rugby players in there, and one of them was making a beeline for everybody. And he he, he whacks, I see him go bang, 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 hit like three people, drunk ones. And I thought, oh, he's making his way towards us. He was a big old lump. And then the next thing you know, I could see him, he was gonna plant one on Chris. So before we planted one on Chris, I planted one on him. He went straight over like. It didn't do me no favours because the next thing you know, I was picked up literally from behind by this other rugby player. My little legs were wagging like that. It's only about 11 stone seven. So you can imagine the size of this bloke to pick me up. He was a big old lump. Got outside. We had a bit of pity patter, as you say. And it would uh, escalated, and I got arrested. Well, I was still standing on my own again. Got arrested, went to Hexham, got, and then returned to go to. I got bail. Went back to Hexham to appear, and I got arrested for the murder that I served twenty years for. Now, this was the murder of, of a guy called Bob McGill in Chorleywood. Tell us, tell us, who, who was Bob McGill? Bob McGill was a, a local hard man, 
very capable man, not to be fooled with by any means. Uh, and his game, which is looking after people, who we say, or sometimes coercing yourself into businesses to be looked after. I say that respectfully for his family, of course, because he's, I don't want to bad mouth the dead. But he was nobody's fault. And in that game, you can't be a fool. And he got shot. Yeah, and I got arrested for that murder. I haven't got the, de the paperwork on me, but some years after I got convicted, I realised that well, I found out why I was put in the frame. And I was put in the frame by a police guard called Roger Vinson. And he had a number of off the record chats with the police where he signed them asking to speak to the police on a confidential basis. And I have that paperwork. I have his custody record from the police station, signed, handwritten. And he engaged in a number of confidential chats where he put my name forward. Um, he was arrested originally for, for another gentleman called David Smith. He's not a gentleman anyway, they are scum of the earth. Schmeagle type, Vincent is, very deceitful weasel. Uh, and Smith's his dog's body, in fact. He was referred to that by a judge at a trial. He was subsequently found guilty for some years later for another murder. Uh, and I found myself in, I was released from Watford Police Station and then rearrested 16 days later and charged with murder. Yeah, I had no what, was idea. That, what was that like? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you're, you know you're, you're on bail for a, for a fight with rugby players. You know, you, you're looking at a potential fine. You're not looking at any time. Next minute, you know, bang, your life's turned upside down. You're arrested for a murder which you didn't commit. Um, you know, your mind must have been all over the place, mate. And, you, you know, you've come from being a successful businessman who's who's got, you know, the world in front of you, you know, potential night out with somebody starring on one of the top soaps. And now you're, now you're facing a, a hefty sentence for something you didn't do. Steve, it was madness because when I got arrested at uh, Hexham Magistrates Court, when I turned up, it was a heavy presence of police. It was like a police van and cars and full climbing. Busy call. And then the next thing in arm, being driven down the M1 with flashing lights, great speeds, front and back cars, armed police, straight into Watford. I thought, what's going on here? Taken after um, when I was charged, rushed into uh, court, Watford, and then sped off to Woodhill for a couple of days, put in the block there. Uh, and then fast-tracked into Belmarsh unit again with flashing lights and armed police. I went into the unit, and I'd read about the unit, just read Parker's Tolls. Up until that, I'd never heard of the unit. It meant nothing to me, all the people in there. And the day I went in there, I've seen the biggest black man I've ever seen, like the Green Mile. He was an American football player, come over here, he'd murdered someone in America, and he was on the run. And the, the day I went into the unit, the staff said to me, oh, it kicked off here today. I thought, oh, did it? Great. He said, don't get involved. I thought, all right, well, I'll be the judge of what I do and don't do. But I, mean, I didn't say nothing. This geezer, he was that big. He used to have mice come in the unit. He used to be able to get a mouse with his feet, bang, stamping on it. And he could get the mouse before it got away. That's how big he was. His shoes were like bats. Marcus was his name. And I was chucked into the unit with the, I wouldn't really say like the, uh, the hierarchy of the criminal underworld. People who used to put a bit of work together and plan it. Not like they do now. I was going to rob people all the time for their, you know, I mean, look, I met Kenny Collins in there, for instance. Kenny's an old school criminal. I mean, the Hatton Garden was planned. And they put a lot of research and work into that. You don't get so much of that no more. It's like opportunist thieving, running into right. Like, you have a demand up. You run into a bank. You get your your your, your till money. But um, it's not the same as it. You don't hear of like major crimes like um, the O2 where they went to get the Berg's diamond and stuff like that. No, they, they make films out of these crimes. I'm not glorifying them, but you see films on the TV all the time, whether it's heist or whatnot. People like those sort of films, and those sort of criminals, there's not so many of them about no more. 
And I obviously met a lot of people in that unit, as well as um, parliamentaries from the IRA, who escaped out of Whiteboard Unit in 1994. They came there on remand, convicted uh, prisoners on remand pending for the escape. Uh, I was made triple category A and put upstairs with them as a young man. Very boisterous. And it was mind blowing for me. Um, I, I, I don't think the concept of it really grabbed me until some years later. But what's this? It's like uh, I went into the unit and it was like a, a prisoner of army, a, a Nazi prisoner camp, all lit up like for people who escape all the time. Flashing lights and floodlights and barbed wire and walls. So it was, a, it was a strange experience for me, as well as the routine what you had to go through was bizarre as a young man who's not done no time at all in prison, really. Tell us a little bit about the routine. So when I was convicted, I was on the outside of my cell, I went to Whitemore Special Secure Unit, triple category A, and you're checked every 20 minutes. So when I came off the category A over... 10 years later, good, yeah, 2011, so 16 years later when I come off at Cat A, I realised I was always looking at the door like that because the doors were always getting checked. So on the outside of my cell when I was triple A, I had two dead bolts and a padlock that had to be taken off and the door had to be electronically opened by an intercom from a room outside of the unit. So they go and say, can you open cell three, please? So they take all the locks off, padlocks. I mean, padlocks on the outside, for God's sake. Well, they must, they must have thought, ask Houdini. Um, in your cell, you can have three forks, two hangers. You was checked every day, strip searched. When you first came out of your cell in the unit, you had Robocop staff dressed in riot gear, with all the shin pads, the army the shoulder pads, the near elbow pads, all them. Ready for a riot. You stepped out your cell, you was rubbed down. You step in your cell, you step out your cell, you was rubbed down. Every room you went into, you was rubbed down when you came out. You were sitting there watching TV. They had big glass panels and there'd be staff outside watching you. And they was, they was at the end of this, it was like a bungalow. It was only a very small place, but there was that many staff. There's more staff than there was inmates in there. It was like seven inmates in there at one time. And in the TV room, it's only a small room, real small, real, real small room, right? You get a cabin there, that's it. We had a camera on a stair, camera on a stair, and staff there. Every half an hour or 20 minutes, they would come in, walk in amongst us, bang the bars of the windows, and walk back out. We haven't moved out of our chairs. But that was just the type of security we had to go through. Big black screen, psychologists walking, sitting behind there, monitoring your behavioural patterns every day. Didn't see no natural sunlight for 27 months whilst I was in the unit. It was a cage with iron bars, flat metal, electric wires, and then electric wires and metal again. So 25 feet, or the size of a small pad of tennis court was a yard. So, and to move cells every twice a month, I moved cells. You'd be put in a sterile cell, which would be blank, bare, and then your kit would be packed up by the staff and searched and then putting the cell with you again. So you're moving cells every two weeks. You don't end up unpacking. You just stay in the box. Because in two weeks' time, or less than that, your cells are going to get searched again. Yeah, it's a strange regime. Contact with your families was through a screen. And you used to have a camera on a seer. I had a lot of assaults with staff in them days. I fought the system. Especially there was a lot of bodybuilders in the time. And the prison was run on violence. And it... Still is to a degree now. Um, and I, I hit a, quite a few members of staff when I was first in Belmarsh Unit, threatening me. I'll never forget it. I hit a member of staff there. And there was a fellow called George Shipton. He was a prison officer. And he said, stop threatening him. He said, what do you keep threatening him for? He said, he's not an idiot. Leave him alone. There's nothing wrong. I remember we got off the bus, going to court. This is some, I jump about here, but these are some stories to do with the unit. And... Um, God went, oh God. He went, don't talk to me. He said, you're an inmate. I went, no problem. No. Gone to the toilet, won't take the cuffs off. I had, to have, I had to get rid of a couple of bad tenants. So better an empty house than a bad tenant, as they say, Steve. So I'm sitting on the toilet, 
And this screw standing opposite me, he's like a barn gate. And he's threatening me, he said, Lane, we ever get you down here, we'll, I'll, we'll kill you. I said, take these cuffs off and we'll talk about it. So I'll just keep threatening me. So I got back to the unit, you've got to take all your clothes off. And I was naive at the game. So I took all my clothes off, I'm standing there, start bottom naked. But you meant to take your top off, put your top back on, then take your bottoms off. Lift the back of your, your, your shirt, show your, your backside, make sure you're not concealing anything in the cheeks of your ass. Lift your bollocks up if they want. And he said, look, I've, so I've took my socks off, and this bloody big doorman, clearly on steroids, to show me a soldier your feet, I said, I've had enough of you, I fucking told you. I'm not a performing clown, and I'm not lifting my feet up. I said, I'll hit you if you keep on. He goes, that's all right, I like violence. I went, crash, crash. He hit the back wall, slid down the back wall. I laugh about it now, and I said to down remember time, it's all right, it's all right, I said, it's all over. Of course, he panicked. He's hit the bell. I'm thinking, this is the first screw I hit in the unit. And uh, I thought, you know, so I'm not struggling. Cool, that don't matter if you're not struggling, you're standing there. They come in, bang, they knock you flying over, get you on the floor, get your arms up behind your back, zip tie you, zip tie your legs, or keep you in locks, took you to the block, cut all your clothes off you. But I said, don't you cut my clothes. I said, if you cut my clothes off me, big shears. I said, I'm going to be the first one of you I get a chance to. You cut my clothes off. You take my clothes took my clothes off. Stuck me in a box. And that's like a concrete cell with nothing. It's just grey concrete. Leave you in there till you calm down. But they leave you in there for very long periods of time. Not hours, either days. If they want to. And put straight jackets on your nose, which they're not allowed to do. But they do. And they did in white my unit. So the units were very tested. But I had some great yeah. times, you know, I have to say. Yeah. You know, you, you obviously, you know, you were an innocent man you, you arrested for this contract killing of, of Bob McGill. Uh, you had a second trial in 96. You were convicted by a 10 to 2 majority jury on circumstantial evidence. That was at the uh, infamous court two of the old Bailey. Um, I think what really amazed me when I was reading the book is just you know, listening to the means and, 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 and what the, the authorities and the measures that the authorities went to to secure this conviction. I mean, we're talking about bent police officers. We're talking about super grasses. Um, even just the whole theatrical show, 24-hour armed protection police officers being attached to the judge, uh, the use of the media, propaganda, uh, you know, labelling you the UK's number one contract killer. Um, articles stating that you, you charged a hundred thousand pound a hit. You know all of this stuff really being leaked by the authorities who are just wanting to to put you away on this trumped up charge. So, you, what what do you do in that position? You know, you, you know from your perspective, you, you want to clear your name. Your family obviously believe that you're you're an innocent man. But you know how did the how did the fight for justice start? How did you manage to maintain a level head? But then, obviously, push on and, and, and continue, you know, fighting back. I remember when I got charged and then I was being told, they can't find you guilty for something you haven't done. Fair enough. Started the trial. All the jury also had 24-hour arm protection as well. When they went to, wherever they went, sat with them. Now, you're not telling me that those police officers never spoke to uh, the jury. You know they've got friendly with them. You know they've said something to them. Uh, and, the, and the foreman in the jury looked like a police officer, okay? Clearly, I said, he looks like a copper. In. Nothing wrong with police officers, but I don't think they should be on a jury to advise them on the points of law, because they're going to be biased nine times out of ten. Very few people wouldn't be, I wouldn't have thought. They should have been impartial. So I remember the, the armed police come running into the court with their guns one day, had set the alarm off. Very disturbing for not just myself, but members of the jury think, what's going on here? And I, I soon unraveled that I was going to get a guilty during the trial, based on I knew they was lying with the evidence. Um, so I, I pretty much, you can't prepare yourself for it, but I really didn't think I was going to get a hung jury in the first one because the evidence was portrayed in such a manner. And I just didn't think I stood a chance. I didn't give evidence very well. I was absolutely shocked at what was going on and, the skilled prosecutor was very good, and I was very naive. Um, based on, I thought, I, just, I can't be found guilty of this. Um, I had the hung jury, went back the second time. 
And they changed the evidence. So Roger Vincent was acquitted in the first trial by the judge's direction. It didn't even go to the jury about Vincent bragging about the murder, um, admitting that he, he killed McGill, his fingerprints in the car. He gave the car to a gentleman. Uh, I keep using the word gentleman. But he gave the car to uh, a man and asked him to burn the car. He wasn't asked to explain that. But that those statements were held from me. I got those statements in 2007. Many years later, I got those statements. They should have been disclosed to court and said, well, how can you say uh, evidence that took the, the, the case away from me was suppressed and withheld? Um, Vincent's confidential chats were suppressed. Because I would have said, hold on a minute, he knows so much about this murder and other murders that he said to you that I have done, which is why they labelled me that £100,000 contract killer, was through Roger Vincent naming me in his confidential chats. In fact, he named me for three murders in those chats that he had. I would have liked to have asked him how come he knows so much about those, or, you know, it became a cutthroat defence if I'd have been told that, but it was held from me. So when he was acquitted by the judge's direction, I felt quite bizarre. I thought, how can that be? He should have been asked to explain a number of facts that he wasn't asked to explain. Um, and then, of course, years later, when you start getting the evidence from, I worked uh, on my case tirelessly. So you asked where it began. It began when I arrived in Whitemore Unit. Uh, I was told by the IRA that there was a grass in the unit. It was a big lad. He was from Middlesbrough. He's dead now. I'm not going to talk about him. He got killed. Um, it was a big lump, 17 and a half stone, six foot four. So I've come to the unit and they've locked everybody up when I got there. And then they unlocked us. And as they unlocked us, this fellow was coming forward. And he's walking along doing this. The only Geordie in there, or Middlesbrough, you've got to be him, innit? So, I mean, I did like 10,000 press-ups in five days. Proper press-ups. Well, not half reps that your nan or granddad does. Army press-ups. Well, my arms are like iron. And I had... Uh, I was a bit wild in my day. I accept that. So, uh, I walked straight up to him and hit him and knocked him spark out. He was out for five minutes. And I leant over him. I said, no one can ever say I've told him anything. So I went forward from there into the block again. Staff all stood around me. Didn't touch me actually. I said, Kevin, you've got to go out the block. I said, no problem. Walked to the block, picked a pen up. I wrote my first letter to David Jessel. It used to be trial and error TV. Do you recall that? Yeah. Uh, and I wrote my first letter to him. And then it went from Letters to because I've never had a TV for the 20 years. I refrained from TV. I'd get it out if Panorama was on or something like that, get it out of the office, watch it, put it up, give it back. And I'd be working all the time. I went to like a glorified word processor they let you have. And wrote over 10,000 letters, compiled my documents, gave my bows to my grounds for my appeal. He obviously knocked him into shape. But I became very well informed in aspects of my case legally. Uh, from reading such a matter and just banged on every door I could bang on via letter and the pen is mightier than the sword hence it got me out yeah I mean oh, you know thousands of letters you wrote you had a lot of support on the outside as well um, just tell us a little bit about you know the you know the book itself obviously it's on sale now on Amazon fitted up and fighting back Fantastic book, fifteen pound for the hard copy, and um, it, UK's number one bestseller. Duncan Campbell, of course, who good friend of mine, and uh, met Duncan on, on many occasions, uh, endorses the book as well. What an endorsement to get! But tell us just a little bit about the book, and was that like a bit of therapy for you? Joel Benet from QC, he said this would make an excellent film. He said you should write a book, and then I thought I was asked to write uh, a chapter about respect and reputations in prison for Charlie Bronson's book. And I, I wasn't really up to it, but I was asked and I thought, okay, I will. So I, I, I wrote a piece on that and they printed the whole nine chapters, whole, whole nine pages, should I say. And then from there I thought, it's been well received. I'm gonna put the case down on paper and let people see what took place during my trials, what happened at trial and what we know now. So I wrote the book in 2004, in six months. And you, you, you change it about a bit, you go back. You, I mean, I've read it five times back to front once, kept reading it, and I still read it now. I still can't tell you where 
I move the chapters around, so I've just moved them around again prior to publication. So I finally printed it, and I've had many book offers over the years, literally. I did an advance as well on the book, £50,000. So that should say something about the content. It was well received. Um, and I wrote the book, and I finally got it out last year, and it's been doing phenomenally well. Uh, it's now available on Amazon and by the Fitted Up and Fighting Back website. We're just having a second print, which is new material going into, into the book, which is an eye-opener again. So it's evolving all the time. Uh, and I found that judges, police officers, I've done speeches at uh, Cambridge University Auditorium. Uh, I've been to Oxford. I've been to the Marley Bone Prestigious Law Society. I've been to Colchester and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm being really well received about the case. And the book has been exceptionally well received. Uh, only yesterday I was told that someone got the book, read 100 pages straight off about putting it down. And the responses that I'm getting from people, and they're not all friends, we're talking of Amazon responses and such, they are five stars. So I couldn't put it down. This is the best book I've read all year. Best book I've read last year. This is a must read. They are the type of responses that are impartial. I don't know these people, so um, they're right across the board, and I'm really well, really uh, pleased with how it's going. Brilliant, mate. Great stuff. So what's next for you then? I mean, obviously, you've just stepped out um, of the prison doors. Yeah, you're back into the, the fast lane. Um, what's next for Kevin Lane? I need some sleep. I must be fair. Last night was quite a hectic evening. Um, I was changing light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> dancing and uh, <laughs> I don't remember going to bed now at one point <laughs> apparently <laughs> I passed out smashed my head <laughs> that's not the way to be I must say but I, 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 let my, I was indoors so it's no harm done so I'm going to get back to work I've got a modular company I started researching the modular homes four years ago and I launched last year, just when Modular has gone, gone mental in this country. But it, I sourced various companies in that trade who do certain types of modular building. So I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to promote the book. I've got a haulage firm where I take mucks out of the ground and material back in. Uh, TCH haulage, big plug there. Modulehomesuk.co.uk, another plug. Um, They've been going well still, but I need to I need to get out. I bring business in, but I'm gonna hopefully my book's gonna take me places. I've had two interests already for about a film talking about that, very positive. Uh, Leon F. Butler, he did a film with Idris Igbar. Is it, El, is it? Yeah, Idris Elba. Yeah, yeah. Um, him, he's uh, directed it with Leon. They want to talk to me, and I've been talking to Leon now for some years, so he's dead keen. Um, Ray Burgess is another one, Love on in a Bay. He did the Wee Man, Paul Ferris film, of course. Excellent film, that. And Good friend the, of mine, Liam. Right. And the actor in that is in, um, is it on something, Line, on TV? At yeah, the Line of Duty, Martin Comston, yeah. He, there's a jock, isn't he? He's, he so, is. And he plays a cockney. You can hear the twang sometimes when he talks, can't you? you he can played a great him. part in that. He played Paul really, really well. And it was, like I say, it's an excellent film. So I'm in talks with them. I'd like to see how what they want to do. I've got a documentary coming up. So um, I'm in discussions with there. That will take place. Uh, be with Ray Burgess. And then the film possibly with, with Leon F. Butler and Idris. So but again, it's a little way off. Um, the book's out there to get people to know about my case. Bring recognition to it. To entice people to come forward. I mean, I had a gentleman come forward called Tam Jury, he's a Scotsman, and he bought the gun off of Roger Vincent used in the murder. And he came forward and said, I purchased that gun. And Roger Vincent phoned him up two weeks after selling it to him, just after the murder, and said, don't get caught with it. He said, I've just blown someone's head off. Tam Jury dumped it in the seat. And then the police went up to see him when he came forward, from half a year police, no less. They shouldn't have gone to see him. It should have been another police force. And by the end of the interview, they were threatening to arrest him for the burden of course of justice. 
He said, I'll take a lie detector test. So I'll get in the box and face the wrath of the criminal fraternity. And he said, if I have to, he said, because there's an innocent man in uh, prison, Vincent and Smith committed that murder. And they told me so. So I'm hoping that the book may serve its purpose, get people to sign change.org so I can get a parliamentary inquiry. But in saying that, the Panorama programme, uh, which is on Fit Up and Fighting Back YouTube, is there for everybody to watch. That on its own, I'm going back to the Criminal Cases Review Commission based on that. Uh, and evidence was used in my trial that should never have been used. And it's been found to have been inconsistent and faulty. So I was found guilty on evidence that was factually incorrect. As Joel Benathan says, my QC, he said it is a game changer. So I'm very hopeful that I may have a positive result at last in the Court of Appeal, once referred back by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, I haven't got faith with the Criminal Cases Review Commission, I must say, in that I've had reviews of them before and they've lasted seven years, one of them, and you've subsequently found out that they're overworked, you get one review officer and they have 40 cases. Well, and then I've also found out that Kalisha, who was prosecuted in my case, he set up the, the Kalisha Foundation and it was to train the barristers. Where do you think they was working during their training? The Criminal Cases Review Commission, <laughs> overseeing miscarriages of justice. I never stood a chance. The former Chief Constable of Police of Hertfordshire was one of the 14 commissioners in the CCRC. And I wrote to them and I said, uh, are there any staff within the CCRC that knew the police officer involved in my case? They wrote back to me and said, yes, it's inevitable that staff within the CCRC know the police officer involved in your car case or know someone who knows him. But this would not cause the impartial observer to form the view of bias. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's there for all to see, isn't it? There for all to see. So it's, it just my, my book contains all these sort of details for people to read, and it's in black and white. So you've got details like that in there, and many others that people will be astounded by, as they will when they watch the Fit It Up and Fighting Back YouTube Panorama documentary, and much more in my book. Well, get yourself uh, onto the YouTube channel, get yourself onto the website, and also get yourself a copy of the book, Fit It Up and Fighting Back. It's on Amazon, doing very well. Make sure when you buy the book, you leave a review as well. Uh, I'm going to let Kevin get back to uh, sorting his uh, bad head out uh, today. <laughs> and A uh, few messages did come in. Big thank you to Terry Ellis, good pal of ours. Uh, he says, nice to see you finally out, Kevin. Brilliant. Vinny Bradish says, top man, Kev. We had one from Charles Salvador earlier on um, by... Uh, proxy from somebody else saying uh, glad to hear he's out and wish him all the best and from Stephen Sears as well he, he passes on his best uh, Stephen. Uh, Emin, uh, Emin says uh, keep punching Kev uh, David Jones says it all sounds like it's grave injustice and uh, Daniel Jones says I used to go to the Par Paradise Club back in the day the bouncers were serious respect to you Kevin from uh, Danny so uh, nice to get a few messages as well Kevin but uh, thanks for coming on and being uh been a great guest and thank you for, for coming on to me first and big thank you to Jez uh, for helping uh, introduce me to Simone who set this up I know she was in a bit of a panic with the the, the traffic etc but thank you to her as well but Kevin look forward to seeing you at the book launch mate best of luck with uh, your freedom and uh, look forward to seeing you soon Steve God bless you thank you very much take care mate bye bye take care all the best thank you everyone